Hello, my name is Andrew Campbell from the YYT and today I'm going to go and give a run through of the light, dark and multi-element cards. I think as a whole it's been a bit of a home run. I'd say all of them have some sort of meaning and uses in well. I'd say some of them are French playable. All apart from one I could see play in modern decks, which compared to Last Opus where a couple of the cards were like the Leon and the Priest kind of they fell a bit flat only one of the abilities seemed kind of reasonable when you're kind of looking at it all but they can be discarded for both Fire and Ice or Earth and Wind I think there has a, been a bit of a step up in design and philosophy in these cards and I'm really quite happy for this but let's dive right in now, the first two cards, Materia and Spiritus, are the Light and Dark Legend. We are only now getting one Light and Dark card in these sets uh, due to the amount of multi-element cards. So, they have kind of mirroring effects. Materia allows you to play two or more Light characters when, she, when she's on the field. Just for clarification, it has been confirmed that you cannot play her if you have another light card on the field. Um, it doesn't work the same way as Cosmos or the other Materia, so that's just something to keep in mind, um, not to go too wild with them. However, they are 1 CP forwards with 2000 power and on entry you pay X CP where X is a light or dark card respectively from deck of that CP. So the video thing about them that sticks out to me is they can be played off Bart's vocal and it can allow you to go really wild with forwards and if you've got a in the future if you get cards that when they're played from the deck or have massive limitations um, they could be extremely interesting in that regard. For Materia, outside of this kind of design, the deck that I think she fits in at the moment would be kind of the Scion builds that we've seen kind of stemming up recently with the Shadowbringer starter deck that's just released. She gives you an additional way to play your Oracle Light from deck, and since these decks are running Keska, having Playing two forwards for four CP, which when one is broken, it allows you to play a Scion from your break zone. It combos in really well, and I think can help you get out that strategy quite fast. If a light forward is broken while she's in the field, um, once per turn, you can draw a card. So that's that's quite a cute effect, and it's one of those things where if you do have multiple light forwards out, I don't think it's very likely. Um, it kind of forces them to target her down first because they don't want you to get caught in fact to do anything. Again, back to this Kefka strategy, it could be really game... You get a really nasty game-breaking turns where you play Materia, get your Oracle of Light deck, break the Oracle of Light and the two forwards you had in the field, and proceed to draw a card, break a forward, play one for break zone, and then you could even possibly do the Regis combo. So, that's what I think she suits in best. <clears throat> there will possibly be other avenues for you to explore with her. But, definitely worth a look. Um, and very much to be kept in mind. Spiritus is, again, exactly similar. However, his effect is you choose one forward on the field and you move it from play. It's a great removal piece and again <coughs> combos in quite well for these Kefka Regis combos that I mentioned earlier on. Being able to move two forwards for the price one is very nasty. Um, the areas that I think he works quite well and would be these kind of dark splash decks, I think, would get a lot more benefit out of them, but I just don't think they're as strong as they really could be at the moment. Um, his targets, I would say, are premium would be Kadaj, 
from the FS7 dual starter decks, being able to play him from deck is kind of a great aggro piece, being able to, for 5 CP dropping a Kadaj and another body, if they target down the Kadaj to get rid of the effect, they, without killing Spiritus first, you will kill a forward, you don't even kill it, just remove it from the game, which with the mood recursion in the game is quite powerful. Other interesting targets could be Shadow Lord. Um, if you're feeling like being a bit techy and you're occasionally worried about playing kind of chickadees or in storm, especially if they're running as Ura's Cryo, and occasionally, the, ironically enough, the 2 have Shadow Lord, be able to kind of go, right, okay, I've got a 1 CP answer to that. Them both actually being able to be searched by Blitzkin, the wind backup from this deck, um, from this opus, is actually rather quite good and it gives, again, more flexibility. They're really quite fun and well. I don't think they're quite top of the cherry pit pile yet, and the fact of that they can clog up your hand if drawn in the wrong order, they certainly have great potential and definitely to look out for in the future. So, for the Fire Ice multiple element card this set, we have Lathwell. And Lathwell I'm a little underwhelmed with. I think he does... I just think compared to a lot of the other dual element cards, especially with him being 5 CP, he just kind of falls a little bit short. The, he does have the kind of discard uh, tax on power, with him being 8k, which when especially when you see some of the other dual element forwards with equally powerful effects, um, having 9k on a free cost, or even the, the next up card being a 4 cost 9k, it does seem a little redundant. And there's other ability of giving a rain-esque when a fire or ice form attacks um, deal 3k. I think it's just a little too weak. Um, I have, I've spoken to a couple of fellow judges and I've came to the conclusion that his fire and ice attacking ability does not trigger twice for fire and ice forwards. I think if that was the case, um, having a 6k swing effect, giving that then to Celtius from the previous set, Bane from the previous set, you could have had a really couple of interesting combos with him, but he's just, he's good, and being a king, he can be searched by Claris, and being a part ice, he can be searched by his sail. So you've kind of got a, a decent fire ice character to search, but I think if you're playing fire ice, he'll go for Celtis over him if you were going to absolutely put up. I think he's just a little redundant at the moment. Until we get some amazing synergy. Um, oh, actually, Axtar can search him in the FFBE card too. Okay. Ah, he's good, but he isn't still. Next up, we have Onion Knight, and Onion Knight is a card which reads amazingly and there's going to be some absolute mad people who can just get the most out. He's got a great floating body. He's a 4 cost 9k, and if they kill him, he, well, he has to go to the break so he can't be turned to hand, or RFG, such as by the Spiritus effect, um, he will play another Onion Knight from hand, which kind of helps fire up the second effect which is kind of the main selling point. For one fire and one win CP, which I think they've balanced it out by having it the two different elements, um, you remove three card name Onion Knights. Sadly, it has to be these Onion Knights, not the Onion Knight ones um, that we've seen from the previous set, and a couple of Tactic Onion Knights in this set. And you choose three fours and deal them 9k. 9k is such a big number at the moment and being able to basically kill three forwards is 
really powerful, especially if you're using no card for hand. However, the issue is you need three Onion Knights. And just trying to get that many Onion Knights and still run a reasonable deck will be the challenge. However, it, it's not impossible with the two cost backup that you pitch a card from hand and you get a card with the same CP to hand. It allows you to kind of combo and play this reasonably okay. This Onion Knight and the Legend Wind Onion Knight from Opus 4, I believe, if I call it correctly. Um, they kind of have some synergies with each other, being able to use each other for the special. Um, being 4 CP each allows you to pitch them for me to grab the other one. We've also got the Lightning Onion Knight, which, again, combo them better with the Wind one. However, this Onion Knight you can swing in, or maybe like block a party, play the Lightning Onion Knight from hand off it, because it ignores the CP um, requirement. You can generally pick up two for ones, and you start to fill up that break zone. There is, there is indefinite interesting uses and I think it's just trying to get the most out it will be quite difficult. I think it can be done though, I think how great it will be will just depend on people's depth ingenuity. Next up we have Cater and Cater I love her but I she does not fit in cadets. The problem is she name clashes with the fire backup and with any sort of deck that focuses around a tribal synergy, this one being class zero cadets, named backups with a job are basically important. They are far more harder to interact with so they can give you a far more standard power for any name checking effects. However, I feel that she is flexible enough and I think it's free some play outfit deck. For example, in maybe an older style Storm deck that's very common and prevalent and powerful in Opus 12, she does get some interesting uses. She's a 2 CP card, so can be played off Fenra. She reactivates three backups, which is always quite nice. That actually is a CP increase, so she works great for lock. And if you just need to kill something, you can tap to so it'd be a tyro and something, and she'll deal at 5k when you're at 5 backup. That's just bang on for crying. So she's flexible, she's in firewind, which yes, it does mean you have to use your tyro, but she can be activated for your lock anyway. She can be played off the 5 CP Fenra, and that will allow you to generally break something and then kill a card, which on top of it while getting a board, a bit of your board back. It's not bad. I, I do have to say. Also, with her being a part fire, if you can use her to, with your own cryo, to use your opponent's master so if you're playing in the fire in the match, it gives you some interesting options. So she, she definitely is nice. I don't think she will have a place in cadets because that name clash is rather unfortunate but yeah she, she gets a passing grade. The next card is Lednar and my goodness Lednar is good. Lednar um, is got an extremely powerful effect but it's balanced by <coughs> you having only, sorry, Lednar is balanced by the fact you only get the fortune counter when you play him and cast him from hand. So if he's resurrected by a march or a phoenix, you do not get this fortune counter. That is important to remember because without it he isn't as good, but he's in the SS tactic so he combos in instantly well with martial fits. Him also being able to pitch for Marsh and or Ritz um, also helps his flexibility and usability. 
However, the fortune counter is where it can be used even outside that. And while he has this fortune encounter, he cannot be broken. So he works really great with board cards. Um, look back to Nadine from August 8. Both the old name, the light summon which deals 9k to the field. Uh, look back to Vila from the Shadowbring of Starter Deck, who's again in colour, who deals 10k to the board. Basically, you can start to give your opponent really nasty choices of okay, I will have two forwards after this, unless you discard two cards. This ability is being an base invincible blocker until he they discard two cards. Really makes him seem like a, a weird ice card. Um, so yeah, he definitely is a threat and will kind of help solidify a board until you can get some really good game winning turns. Definitely worth its legend status and it would be a card that would highly recommend hunting. Next up we have Hope, and Hope is a fantastic card. He is kind of combo school 101. And he kind of allows you to think of interesting combos and using cards that you probably wouldn't have used before. He has two very different effects, again, one being kind of wind flavoured, one being ice flavoured. His ice effect, um, basically <coughs> allowing you to, when anything becomes dull juice in effect, if now frozen, it is extremely powerful. If we look to cards such as the Eduardo backup from previous set, which now if you have hope in the field, reads dull and freeze your opponent's field. Um, there is an important caveat where the character has to be active before it's dulled. So it's kind of balanced where if your opponent has interaction to use, they can kind of save their backups by using the CP up. However, they need to be extremely careful around how they use their CP and what cards they keep active because any of your dull cards now read instantly better. A uh, Glazial Abolos can now easily read dull and threes, a forward, deal something, 7k. Cards such as the. I think the, the very simple one would be the backup snow now reads dull and freezer forward when you attack. Um, there's lots of great and interesting things with this first ability. And the second ability is also really good. Arguably this is why Battle Aikido kind of got nerfed. Um, because when a can dull character you control becomes active you can choose another two characters and activate them. It becomes really silly and efficient when you can either make your own uh, Gido active without targeting it for its own effect and then have it more reliably, or just the fact of being able to pay Gido that turn, do its effect, and then get two backup three off that. It's really quite a nasty combo and I'm, I'm glad that they have made that effect once per turn. So it, it definitely is still a great effect though. That reactivation is really good and can help cards such as the Ice Wind Lock from last set just kind of setting up for really efficient hyper combo based turns. Um, cards such as Battle Eye, sorry, um, but Vandalus end up combling really well with this card. While they have a similar freezing backup effect, where they come in is with them both being Ice Wind and especially Category 13, because they can both be searched off 
Morgue 13. Um, when you play Pandemodium, with hope you get CP back that you paid and an additional 2 CP. Pandemodium also combos in really well for Fandalus with his leaving with 2k and Pandemonium can kill them off. It's quite easily possible to drop Pandemodium and Perfandalus in the same turn while spending 2 cards in hand and only 2 CP. Definitely, definitely a threatening card. One final note on him, with him being called Hope, he's able to be searched off the Opus 1 backup Nora 3CBEX, which it's quite cute to have a way of searching both Ice and Wind CP off that card. It, it's just another cute piece of energy and definitely is a card to look out for and be very wary of it in the future. Next up we have Uni and Uni reads well. She has an extremely high ceiling. Um, if we think back to the kind of massive CP summon ready edX from an opus or two ago. Uni really combos well in fact because she allows you to use these big nasty summons you had in your break zone previously and basically force your opponent to choose would you prefer to be hit by a Raiden, I'll break an RFG something, or a Bahamut where I'll deal 10k to two things and will RFG them if they die. It gives you interesting big turns like that, however where she falls short is you're not in control. Now Uni is only as good as the summons you have in the break zone. So if you only have two really good, if you've got one really good summon and then two kind of mess summons that are not really going to advance your turn, they're just going to go, okay, I'll RFG the mediocre summon. Um, so you've lost a summon in your grave. And she's really affected more by your break zone removal than thingy. I feel she has to also be competing with Kryl for spots. And while well, you could argue she cast a card for free and Kryl you have to pay, Kryl's a two cost. She's cost efficient and can do it twice, if not more, due to kind of tapping in one for the effect. So it's a really difficult spot. She also has a absolutely mad special, uh, I think 20,000 damage is the highest we've ever seen printed for damage. Um, for one copy of herself and Ice and Earth CP is specific again um, and you get to search a summon. So she has lots of great lines of text but I just feel you have to compete with the fact of Trial exists and wants to use your break zone and your opponent's break zone, of course, at kind of a reasonable and moderate pace. And Uni just doesn't quite fit in. She is Ice Earth, which for Storm decks, similar to the last opus, she can't help you as a way of playing your lock. But I just feel she competes with Kryl Touch to be used in kind of similar decks. Definitely a card to build around, but I'm not quite as big of a fan of it as a lot of people seem to be. Next up we have Delita, and Delita is your basic 2CP I do. And, well, I'd argue that both these effects are actually both quite earthy, but he is quite a good combo card. He is a Kusif, get back a character, of course two or less. Um, that's the kind of alright effect. 
um, or select one character you control and break it. For me, he feels like he wants to be in Ranpair. And we haven't seen Ranpair for a while and it may come back. Um, the kind of old tricolour Ranpair. I think it, these decks actually kind of get slightly better with the kind of consistency of having the dual element cards. But being able to, just for 2CP, set up the Ranpair combo, being able to get back your two cost Ranpairs. Two cost also brings back Kryl, so she could even see a place. I feel like I've said this a lot today, but in Storm. So, he's got two very simple effects, but the thing that I like about it is the fact you get to choose. That's what makes a lot of these simple one or two effect cards really simple and good. White Tiger Lucy Nimbus. He is very, very simple, but good. <clears throat> I'm not as big a fan of the fact that you have to pay for backups, but I think it kind of helps slow them down realistically. You're only going to be able to play them from turn 3 onwards. But I think he would have been actually really quite powerful. Like extraordinarily powerful if you could play him on turn 2. Um, kind of have him as a instant dull freezing effect. However, we carry on. We have to actually look at what he does and he is a cheap 9k that every turn will dull and free something. He's big to get over and he just does a good job well. The uh, fact he can freeze characters can help lock down titles which for Storm can hurt or kind of any other sort of multi-element decks. Just being able to get rid of a problem for it every turn and leave up a big chunky body is quite threatening. Absolutely solid card. Next up we have Goodon and the world seemed to lose their mind over this card and I understand it's good. He's above the kind of so-called 2p for 1cp curve and he can't become dull so he really is anti-ice and maybe to a minor extent anti-lightning and he can attack twice per turn which when you're 9k is really big but he is just incredibly slow. Once he gets the turn to kick about yes he will do some absolutely horrendous stuff to your opponent being able to easily go, swing, swing again. Okay, you can easily do two points of damage if they don't stop him. However, because he is no protection from kind of any abilities or summons, he's quite easy to comb up very well. The difference between see him and his kind of closest competitor, Yustola. Yustola has haste, so she can deal that damage on the turn she comes down. She has some kind of inbuilt protection so she can't be combo killed and she also can't be blocked by costs four or more so she really gets around bigger bodies but good on is great for churning up and chumping fields but I feel he just does not do enough impact the turn he comes down. If left unchecked, he will be an absolute monster. Him being an Earth Wind means that he is a prime candidate for the Shikari decks. Shikari's love kind of cards can help them clock up damage before they get their turn where they get their triple damage ping to being able to go two, four, seven. With good honor is probably quite easy now. He's definitely a card to 
look out and watch for, but don't feel very scared. Just take it calm. It's quite easy to kill. Of note, the wind searcher for FFB actually does make him slightly better, of course, being able to get them in cover. That's actually one thing that I probably should have mentioned a little bit earlier on, but hey, I've got memory like an epileptic goldfish. Next up we have Kunshira, and Kunshira is super interesting. They are a hasty 2 cost forward for 9k power. I love it how they've balanced them for the fact of they lose power when they get down CP, um, when you've got more backups. <coughs> so if you do really fun turns and you break backups, she can then go back up to being a 9k. Um, for really aggressive aggro wind lightning decks, she will be a massive threat, especially for special, in which you can attack for, use a special, activate, and then reduce all your opponent's hordes by 4,000 power. And she can attack again, but also gains first strike. She will be an absolute menace and can put your opponent into really horrific positions. If you can combo in any sort of board wipe effects, um, such as a Odin 1 CP um, from Opus 10, it'd be quite easy, or Pandemonium, it'd be quite easy to deal 7, 8k to field and she really does put your opponent in quite nasty positions very quickly. I really do like cheap forwards that have great power <coughs> and I would definitely watch out for her. Um, rather simple what she does, just kind of be aware. Next up we have Golbez, a wonderful, wonderful card. Uh, this is the box set topper for this uh, opus, which is interesting, it actually will be the first opus um, box topper who is multi-element. A uh, very niche and novel thing, but Golbez is really good. He is the king of consistency, being able to search for any one card of course to add it to hand. Now, not only is this an EX burst, which EX bursts are great, um, but it definitely specifies card and not character. So yes, this is great, it can search you back up, being able to search a cosmos or a chaos can be really nice for element fixing. Having a searcher for them is good. Um, if you need specific backups for decks, um, not sure why, but if you're running a tricolor YRP deck, you could search for your Riku backup. Or if you were, you can search specific two cost backups, you can search specific two cost forwards. Um, I hate to reference Storm again, but being able to go, I can get my Ash, um, kind of build up a massive board and get some really good hand and card advantage going, being able to get a Krail or a Shadow Lord, um, to keep it an element, the Kunshira from previous cup, um, uh, previously mentioned is a wind lightning card so it actually combos in very well in element having a way to kind of get out another beat stick card. Where I think the thing that will be good is he can also search summons. Being able to search the chocobo summon for example will be quite nice. Um, <coughs> allowing you 
you to bounce him or any other card back to hand. Um, being able to search. I'm not sure if you could hear that, but someone has absolutely rocketed past my house at goodness knows what speed, whatever. He just is super flex from watch research, which makes him great. His damage six, I think we'll see this rarely, um, and it is massively encouraging the Archfiends, <coughs> who basically both of these effects trigger, and you can choose which order that you stack them in. So normally I think you'd want to trigger the damage six last in the way you're supposed to play it. Um, have the search for a two cost card in hand. The damage six effect is you search for three cards of cost two and add them to hand. But now you may play as many Archfiends as you have in your hand. Coincidentally, all Archfiends this opus from this set are two cost. So that, that's that's the combo, that's the play that you're meant to do. Whether I think that's a reliable enough deck strategy, <coughs> it needs to be seen. Gobez can be played off the Barisha from this set. Um, who, when you have the four arc chains, you get to play Gobez. So they kind of do get a fun interaction, they get to play each other. Um, it is a great effect, but I think of it being at damage 6, it's a bit too late to kind of use it um, at an opportune moment. Normally you're at damage 6, your deck will be thinning out, so getting 3 CP cards, um, uh, well actually this point to be getting 8 CPs worth of 2 cost or less cards is really powerful, but I don't think it works the way the designers intended, I think, five damage is too weak for you to use it in a strictly arching deck. However, as a standalone forward, it's excellent. It'll give a good boost to Wind Lightning. It'll give actually it'll give a good boost to any element you can manage to fit it in. Absolutely a standout card, and it is I'm really happy that it's a box of topper, especially of how beautiful the card looks in full art. <coughs> Next up we have Lightning and I said that most of the cards were a hit and I think this is the only card that I can consider a wee bit of a flop. I think the biggest problem with Lightning is she's called Lightning. Um, Lightning is a really common card name and especially within the past three sets um, we had the, actually technically it's four sets because it's opus 10, but we've had the six cost lightning who searches for two Odins on entry, um, especially for really good Odins that have been printed in the past couple of sets. Um, you have to compete with that for in a, a lightning Odin searching sense. Um, and the heroic full art lightning from this set who can either get you two cards back from your break zone um, when she leaves the field or when she enters the field will just RFG two of your opponent's forwards allowing you to push for game. <coughs> One way or another she will cause your opponent great amount of trouble and she has to compete with these two cards and while I like to look in the bright side uh, Lumina does mean she's now a lightning card like I said for lightning or wind CP but she has to compete with those other lightnings and I just feel that in pretty much every other deck <coughs> you can either play a better two cost lightning slash x forward or a better lightning. <coughs> Which is unfortunate because I really do like that art. <coughs> so sorry, I think this is the one of the few 
cards that I'm just not able to give that great a review of. <coughs> oh, sorry, I thought the mic had been on mute. Next up, we have Wall, and Wall is a extremely solid two cost. Um, I like him better now that I've seen card two in advance of this, I believe. Um, he gives other Mobius forwards 2k power, so that does include the Mayor from a set of goal, which also gives him haste. Uh, nice cutie combo. It's a good field buffing ability, I think. It sadly doesn't push out your Fusoya from being killed off by Amaterasu, but a good permanent 2k buff to all Mobius forwards is good. The thing that I like about him is when he deals your point, opponent a point damage, you get to get a Mobius character back from break. And character retrieval is quite good. It makes it basically pays off his CP cost if he deals one point of damage, which I think can force your opponent to maybe be encouraged to block him when they previously wouldn't. Interestingly, he's a warrior and not a warrior of light, which comes he comes out. I don't think he would have fit in a standard warrior of light deck, so I don't think that's too much of a miss, but it's definitely something of note. Wall, as Mobius cards get better, I think Wall will also increase to get better, and a 2 CP 7k is, while not game breaking by any means. I mean we've seen Kuchira that it was 2 CP 9k but definitely a solid card. I was ready, it was too in advance but we have Sarah Mobius who is extremely solid. Um, she'll fit into Water Earth decks, she can fit into the kind of Storm decks of the last Opus because she has two great on entry effects. The Earth effect um, basically works as a hecatonk here, so you choose one of your forwards, one of your opponents, they deal the damage to each other. It's really simple and good removal, being able to turn your massive big bodies, um, think your Fina's, your Eustola's, who Eustola is especially good target because she doesn't really take damage <coughs> if it's less than her power. the Boonie Yalavi big 10 cost self card being 10k and being able to deal that to a card is really nasty or you just get to draw a card and she's pretty much paid for herself apart from the CP cost really efficient really simple but good effects I really like it um, Just simple and good. Being able to be played off Lena is actually really nice. I do quite appreciate that about her. Um, just an all round great card. But I think possibly my personal favourite is the next one. And it is Sophie. Sophie is also a two cost water there forward. And on first look, a two cost 4k is pretty mediocre. Where she becomes interesting is she gains 2k power for each water forward other than herself and 2k for each air forward other than herself. At the end of the turn, if Sophie is 10,000 power or higher, you draw a card and deal them a point of damage. Now that is terrifying. Key parts to note is cards that are dual element count as both. So Sophie, um, sorry, Sarah is a water and a air forward. So she will give Sophie 4k power. Yuri will give Sophie 4k power. And it's really easy to tick that power up easy. The wall that was mentioned earlier on, well, it is in Earth Lightning. 
it is still quite easy to get that up in power. Basically she gives lots of decks just a little bit extra grinding power. As long as she's 10k power, your opponent loses a turn and you get a card. Also, her being a monk, she can be played with the Ursula from Two Oaks as well, which is also a really great synergy. Monks quite like to go wild, wide with big fields and they've got buffing effects. And as long as you stack it correctly so that Sophie's effect goes off first before a buffing effect goes off, She'll deal the point of damage and drawing one card. She will require some deck building around her, but there is so much interesting things to do with her. I really like her and think once people know how to build her well, she will be a staple, really seen card. Unlike Doga, Doga is my goodness, it is a beautiful, beautiful, full up, generally stunning piece of art. But I just feel that all his effects are just priced a bit up than what they really did it to be. Oh, sorry, something just popped up there. Um. Basically, I think you're, you're meant to discard three summons for him and he essentially becomes a free forward and basically the more summons you get, the bigger he gets and if you've got loads of summons in the break zones you can swing and cast a card, yeah, cast a summon from hand which means you can even go wild and cast for a, like a, an ink wasp Bahamut, he, in a way, has meant to combo well with the, the Rydia from previous Opus is where Uni would allow you to, I think the idea is they combo all together, you'd have Uni using your pitched summons, Doga is using the summons from hand, and Rydia would get them from deck, and they kind of all combo well together. However, Doga just ends up being just a bit too much. His power lies on the amount of summons used and using them in kind of a rather inefficient way you're having to discard them or hope they are discarded for play. His on entry effect is only as good as cards you discard so Otherwise, he's just sometimes a big, <clears throat> powerful forward. So maybe you get one or two cards <clears throat> back from it, but it's going to be really rare that you discard cards for him. The fact that you have to discard three cards to play him, he ends up... You have to have a massive hand, and you're going to get rid of all that hand, and kind of hope you're drawn to something good off him. Um, and you can't even use his summon casting effect until the following turn. He also really won't be that strong. I mean, every three summons he gains 1000 power. Um, if we can. Why is it fine on Yuna Legend from Opus 6, but not fine on Doga? because it was an extra ability to tell you to reactivate any of your other forwards. Doka just gets 1k bigger for every three. It just is far too slow. Even if you have the nine summons that you require for ability, he only goes up to 10k. That really, a couple of opuses ago, that would have been impressive, but that isn't anymore. And even having nine summons in break zone, is wild. I mean that is almost a fifth of your deck 
has to be in the break zone before you can use his casting effect. Even the kind of higher summon running decks, Storm, even Gull Wings were only running 15 summons. I think 18 is the absolute most I've seen. If you're running that number of summons in a deck, you're going to have absolutely no room for monsters, which that's fine, but it's just another deck kind of very structured and linear you have to be and you have to get those 9 cards and break and then you need to have at least one of them in hand so you're only going to get 6 shots for it and you need to wait a turn for it to happen I just I can see what they were going to but each of the abilities are just pitched a little bit too high and I feel it's ended up meaning it misses the mark he has potential, for sure, but he has a really, really low floor. Him being a water and air forward, it's cute because you can pitch him for water and air CP, but he just misses out for me. Next up we have Ramza, and I really like Ramza for a good couple of reasons. The first thing is his five more character FFT characters is getting much easier and easier to do. Um, especially with the Night Searcher Jukoktana being category FFTT. So that's one. One cost for him. Um, Ovelia, the water backup, is another two cost backup. Just as cost by three again if you get the thing is. So you're looking at big colours in FFTT with searchers in FFTT being what you'd want for him. Um, I think it's probably really easy to get five or more characters. I mean if you're incredibly desperate. I know the Lightning uh, Summoner 1 CP backup is SFTT. I believe the Water Summoner also is as well. It would be really easy to ramp out backups and make him a, a four cost character that gets rid of two forwards very easily. Um, the interesting thing that I do like about him, however, is while you don't get to choose if you choose two targets, if you choose one target, however, um, I should mention it's uh, returning to hand and putting into the break zone, you, if you only choose one target, because you have to do, I choose this card for putting into the break zone, and then I choose the second card out, well, the second card is then put into hand. If you only choose one target, as it says, never mind, I read a dodgy translation and that section's absolute nonsense. You have to choose two forwards. So if they only have one forward, then yeah, you get no effect. It still is an extremely good game winning card him being in water and lightning which are big FFT colours for a knight him being able to be searched by Gawain from the previous set um, being a water fire card that searches a water and fire knight card being able to search lightning CP off him is quite good for the tricolour decks he is a great game winning card good for element fixing. He's a he's a solid rare and definitely one to watch out for. The fun and lightning rare is Aldor Emperor and this card's just good. Um what I like about him is he has flexible destruction. Um, 
you can shoot forward, deal at 7k. Okay, if that's what you need, you can use it then. If they have a free cost to lower forward, you can just straight up break it, so you don't need to worry about your Stola's protection, for example, you're just going to break it. Or, if you need that little extra power, as long as it's active, you can deal 8k. And if you've taken 5 points of damage, you get 2 of them. So you can deal something 7k, break the free cost. It is simple, clean, good. Flexible. It's kind of everything you want. Fire and Lightning is kind of really coming into form in this opus especially. Him being an FFB card means he can be searched off Axstar. He's really something that could be quite nasty and kind of late game he can really help you push for game by getting rid of two blockers. Very simple, it's kind of not very much combo things to base off him. He's just a good solid card with good words. Next up we have Nine and on paper Nine is incredible. Um, him being a Fire Lightning Cadet is great because he helps link together those colours but the biggest thing about him is you can dull any Fire and Lightning Job Zero class of deck and that's you pay the CP cost. Being able to be so CP efficient and kind of ramp out massive boards is amazing. Now, <coughs> paying one CP in a, a, a forward you just played that turn, that's pretty easy to do. That is, that's already great. However, what his amazing ability is when he attacks or enters the field, so he's more than a threat than just a turn you play him, as long as he lives and as long as you've got a reasonable word of cadets, they will lose 2000 power for each cadet you control. Now this is why me mentioning Cater earlier on is not good in cadets because that takes away one fire cadet backup. Now, takes away any cadet backup but especially being a fire backup. Um, it's harder to break backups on the stacks of effects so you lose additional power with Rem, Cater, there is an additional backup but I've forgotten it at the second. With those two and nine that's 6k reducive power on swing and on entry. Um, if you have a really wide board, it's so easy to reduce a forward power by 10k. The great thing is you're reducing it forward, it's power by x amount rather than dealing it, which means it gets around protection effects. Um, such as Ishtola, um, either one, or Aerith effects, Minwoo effects, or cards that can't be broken, uh, such as the <coughs> uh, Arden from Opus 7, who is a big beat him off, but he does not just his power, so it kind of softly put into the break zone an extremely dangerous card and I think between him and the ace from Opus 9 or 10 there is some real great hope for cadets to become really playable once again. The one thing I don't say and it's, I, it's really funny that my biggest disappointment about nine is actually not about nine at all. In fact, there was no new lightning cadets in this set, which does make him a little worse in sealed play. Um, as you you won't ever be able to do his dull and active lightning zero cadet because there's no class zero cadets and lightning in this always. But 
he is a great card and he as cadets get better he will only become better he has no name clash to worry about he is just straight up great next up we have Noel and uh, Noel is I think that some people kind of rap on him about being just meh but for me he is kind of a, a game ender kind of card also him being fire and lightning category 13 he can be searched all lumina giving you fire and lightning kind of searching is quite nice i think that's more kind of important because that is a, a unique element combination as opposed to wind lightning a uh, the lumina searching the previously mentioned two cost lightning that happens more frequently Giving another forward haste in 2k is powerful. Dulling two forwards is powerful. No combos in quite well, even if you were actually using it in a silence deck, being able to give that 9 haste, that's great. <coughs> um, being able to dull two forwards so you can swing through a board is great. Um, it's rather simple stuff that Noel does, but he can just really help you clinch out a game, and it's quite nice. I can't fault him for it. He doesn't do anything absolutely amazing, uh, but I can't say he's a bad card by any means. He just is good. Next up, we have Yusuke and. Yuzuki is a rather interesting card. I really like her. Because she does lots of little things that you might not quite realise at first. Um, with her being a free cost fire card, even though she's a work card, she can be got off Magisa from the previous set, which means she can kind of help you in situations that you would kind of have trouble with board wiping cards by any sort of combo pings making that damage come zero instead makes it really difficult again for being take off means you can be resurrected by the phoenix during your opponent's turn you can kind of flash it in and now that kind of board wipe is going to happen um, yeah, that doesn't happen. Even the fact, I mean, especially the fact that box abilities such as Feeler, 10k board wipe, nope, that's not happening. Uh, your opponent wants to use a There. We'll go for the Ranji from the same Shadow Ring starter deck. Uh, okay, that damage is reduced to zero. Because it is become zero instead and not negated, the Ask of Final Leon will still deal 10k. And it still would deal 10k with the second water. It calls quite well to make kind of fire decks a bit more protective. Um, she's actually meant to combo in with a card with the Water Ice Legend. Um, you can see with a mirroring art style in a second, but Yuzuki is interesting for the fact that she kind of helps you kind of in, situ in kind of certain situations. You can't get fire something they didn't really have a lot of protection. Um, so I would, I would definitely keep in mind if you are running a, a fire deck, it can kind of help in the mirror match against Samurais and any cards that you don't want to do that have abilities that deal damage, she can help, can help you out with that, which really is quite nice. So water decks, um, just protecting your field is really nasty. Um, 
just making your earth feel that bit more spongy. It really can kind of push you through bad games. Just a really solid defensive card, just kind of helping you in really bad matchups. Next up we have Ontonisia and this is another absolute knockout card. Um, the great thing is she's flexible. What a knife. Um, due to being 2 CP you have to pay one of each CP or overpay for it, which is a little disappointing. But now that she's 2 CP she can be resurrected off later. Um, so your opponent can either discard a card you choose. You can discard a card from your hand, which if you're picking out the last card, that's really powerful. But I think the more interesting effect is the choose a card you control and turn it into his hand, which just allows you to replay some really silly cards. Um, it's cheap. That the turning your own mechanics on can just allow you to pull off so many combos with seen the strength of Myoni and Althea in recent sets. Or also being a two cost means that you can she can be a phoenix target, so you can actually use phoenix defensively to bounce back something you want to keep while also dealing a bit board weight damage and dropping a forward. Um, in the being to turn like a Shantotto to your hand could be quite nice. She just as a general all round nice card, great flexibility, and will continue to see play. For as long as there's not a better, cheaper, or more accessible alternative. Next up, we have Chime. Now, Chime is a slightly better um, effect than Ramza since you choose, not your opponent. Um, but again, your opponent does require two forwards for this effect, which is a little disappointing but it is quite simple it will clear two cards off the board it will tap for 2 CC, uh, CB it's sounded good um, it's not stellar I don't think it quite reads as powerful as it wants to be and I don't think it really has any great synergy, but when we do get synergy for these sort of cards, it will be quite strong. Dulling and freezing will always kind of help you clutch out again. So, again, if it can just be added back to hand with Idolus or kind of a ragging sort of thing late game, yep, get rid of the two threats to your board and put your opponent in a difficult position. It's good. Just good. Next up we have Celestia and now you can see the kind of thing that we're going for, the kind of red to blue to white as it gets with the kind of being mirrored stats. Now Celestia stops from being broken by abilities. Uh, water forwards. So water characters, that's actually quite key because that also protects your water backups. <coughs> if you have key water backups, for example, um, if you're wanting to use the... Oh, what's she called again? Lunafreya from Opus 9. Um, your opponent's not going to get... is not going to be able to break it because of Celestia, so they have to break Celestia and I think if you've got key water backups that you require um, again going back to the YRP example being able to keep a hold of your water backups without them breaking it is that's something extremely interesting but water can't be broken that's some bells that don't deal down and then <coughs> Yuzuki then makes all your water forwards take less damage. Um, 
It's also got the kind of punished effect of even if you do target them, um, you choose a character um, and don't freeze it, which it's one of those ones where if you do play it early, she can be a pain because even if you do try and remove her, um, she can just punish your opponent for trying to do that, even if they don't succeed. So she gives a lot of it as well. She kind of reads as a kind of trunch hold you're going to stop your opponent from doing anything. And she does do that. <coughs> but in a deck kind of built around protecting an idea, she will help you hold down your board. And she will kind of punish your opponent and make your opponent play around doing the standard play. Um, she really hurts Lightning, which Lightning is looking really powerful. Uh, special Behemoth K breaks cards that target her. If they can't be broken because of Celestia, that removes one of their biggest kind of effects. And if you're taking out one of their key kind of protections of it, it makes her quite a great card. I think Water Ice might see a bit of an upcoming tick in the meta game, especially the amount of straight up raw removal seen in the game. Now that has been the entire set. Thank you very much for listening to this for an hour and 15 minutes. I have to thank you for staying and supporting the channel and I hope during these trying times, I know it's been long <laughs> and arduous, it's been 12 months of this on the 23rd, but we've got through this. There is light at the end of the tunnel and we are going to get through. Have a nice day.